All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Icicle Seminar Series. Uh, today, I'm really pleased. We have a talk from George Cantor. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction and then say a little something about George. So George is a senior system scientist at Carnegie Mellon University's Robotics Institute. He is also the chief scientist and co-founder of Bloomfield Inc. He has over 20 years of experience in research in developing and deploying robotic technologies for real world applications such as agriculture, mining, and scientific exploration. He uh, very recently just received a Best Paper Award uh, for agri-robotics uh, from the IEEE Intelligent Robotics and Systems Conference, also called IROS, one of the leading conferences in the field. Uh, that was 2021. He holds his BS from Michigan State, which we won't hold against him here at Ohio, and uh, PhD degrees and masters from uh, University of Maryland College Park. I've had the opportunity to meet with George quite a bit uh, at various conferences. So we've been sort of following each other to conferences in this digital ag space recently. And I can say he's a very thoughtful person, very forthright and uh, keen sense on what exactly the field needs right now. So we can out any further ado. Hand it over All right, to well, thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I hope the people online can hear me all right. I, uh, and, and I appreciate that um, there was an offer to do this talk remotely over Zoom, but I only live a few hours away and I really miss like this kind of in-person interaction. So it was, you know, worth it to come here. Looking forward to the conversation. Um, you know, I have a bunch of slides and stuff like that, but uh, really I'm here to talk to everyone in the room and everyone online. So please feel free to like stop at any point, ask questions. If I don't get through all my slides, it's not the end of the world. That's not what this is really about. So um, so I want to figure out how to work my computer first. I want to just start with this video. Uh, and this is um, a video I took, Bakersfield, California. These are table grapes. And this is obviously a person harvesting table grapes. Can you see? Oh, sorry. Um, and so, so this is kind of for me. This is like a mission statement in a in a sixty minute video. I do robotics. Um, as you know, robotics has been very successful in lots of different domains. Um, automation has been very successful in agriculture over millennia, uh, but robotics and agriculture are just starting to come together. Um, and so there are these still these large number of agricultural tasks that have resisted automation because they require human dexterity and human intelligence. Um, and this is an example of one. And so when I watch this person, I just see this long list of things that we have no idea how to do. And it starts right at the beginning where she's looking at the grapes and trying to find one that's that's ripe to pick a cluster. And she can perceive the clusters and, and realize that she's got to check the backside and then she can grab it, gently turn it around, inspect the backside. Once she's done that, she knows that it's ripe and she cuts it off the vine. And then she does this, which is just a mind-blowing task from the perspective of a robotics person. She's got this soft um, bunch of flexible grapes, and she's in there making these very precise little cuts and cleaning out the bad grapes and knocking out sticks and stuff, and then throwing the cluster in the bin. And so you look at that sequence of things, there are some things we're close to being able to do, some things that are probably 25 or 35 years away. Um, and... From an academic point of view, I, I just look there and I think PhD thesis, PhD thesis, PhD thesis. <laughs> um, so there's all these problems here that, that we're, we're working on. And so what I want to talk about today is it's going to be a long time before we have machines do anything like this. But I want to talk about, talk about the journey that I'm on and, and, and kind of how what the, what the roadmap I've been following is and where I think we're going. And so um, this is Sanjeev Singh. He was uh, he was. My mentor, he hired me as a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon uh, a long time ago. And uh, we, around 2005, probably, we were visited by um, a, a group from Washington State who wanted to look into automation for apple harvesting. 
And they came with the hopes that we would tell them we could build robots to pick apples. Um, and we talked to them, we sort of learned about their needs, and we just had to be honest with them. I mean, you know, picking a robot to pick apples, we said was, you know, probably 20 years and $50 million away. And of course, they didn't really like that answer, but it was the answer we had to give them. By the way, we're almost 20 years later, and we still haven't really got a robot to pick apples, but hopefully we're getting close. Um, so, what, but what Sajib did, he was very smart. He said, look, we can't build you the robot you want, but we can get on the path so that we actually hit that 20 years instead of hitting 40 years, whatever. It's like, it's like planting a tree. You got to plant the tree. You got to let it grow. And so he said, this is the path. And he like drew this on the back of a napkin. I wish I still had the napkin, um, but he drew a simple little plot. And he said, here's the things we can do. Um, and they, the things we're closer to and the things that are farther out and how complex they are. And so things we could do at that time were sensing. And, you know, the next thing up the list was mobility. So sensing is just you know, measuring things in the environment. And at that point in time, people were already using sensor networks and computers and things like that to, to measure stuff. Mobility was kind of getting around in agricultural environments. Uh, 2005 is kind of self-driving cars first started becoming sort of popular. So those autonomous mobility capabilities were at least envisionable. And then far out in that corner is, is manipulation. So manipulation is what that woman was doing when she was picking those grapes. And it's like, it's not only is it gonna take more time and be more complex, but it's further out in both axes, right? Um, in fact, if we could draw the napkin bigger, it would be further up in, in the corner. Um, so we started down this path and um, what we, you know, we did sensing, we did mobility, I'll show you a couple of early results. And then, um, and then we got, once the mobility was, I'm not gonna say solved, but to a mature enough point where we're ready to move on, we kind of discovered what was, what was next, which was what I'm gonna call perception. So this idea of taking the sensor data that we can collect and use it to build models of the world that ultimately a robot can reason about and make these kinds of intelligence decisions like you see the person harvesting grapes in the field to. Um, so this is just kind of a, a summary of, of some of those early works. Um, you know, sensing, we did a lot with, with sensor networks and irrigation control, mobility. Um, we kind of took the self-driving car ideas and made them into self-driving agricultural vehicles. Actually, it's a significantly easier problem than the self-driving car problem because the environment's more constrained and you know you don't have to worry about someone looking at their cell phone and stepping out in front of the car at the time. And the tasks are much more defined than sort of general purpose driving. Um, so that's a that's a what the Washington State Sunrise Orchard, and that's just a little utility vehicle driving up and down the roads. Really boring video, that's the point. It's really boring to try to open that rose. And then um, the perception is sort of taking raw, it, raw data. In this case, we're sort of looking at images collected by a camera of apple trees, and then using kind of these this whole host of techniques we have to take those images, turn them into 3D models, um, detect things like apples, uh, reason about where things are in 3D. Um, and you know, in this particular case, this was probably 10 or so years ago, we're worried about counting apples and not double counting and, and, and those kinds of things. So these are kind of three of the, of the core technologies that go into a more capable autonomous system at some point in the future. Um, and, you know, I sort of look at these things, when I see people like Elon Musk talk about AI and they're like, oh, it's gonna take over people and it's this one massive megalithic thing. I don't really see it that way. Like, like we have, to me, AI is, a whole bunch of tools and maybe someday I'll come and some will join them all together into something that puts us all out of business. But, you know, in the meantime, we have these things that we all just kind of lump together as AI. And for me, they're, they're, they're around these three things I'm talking about, sensing, perception, um, and, and ultimately mobility. Um, and so we, we've been, you know, for the past 20 years, um, we've been taking these tools and applying them to solve agricultural problems. Um, and so I, I'll talk about a couple of those to, to, to um, just kind of explain how this has worked for us. So one is, uh, this was the Efficient Vineyard Project was a collaboration we did with Terry Bates at Cornell University. Um, and he's been spending a long time thinking about vine balance in, in vineyards. And so the idea here is that, uh, you know, the vine, 
will set more grapes than the grower wants to be there. And you need to manage this balance between how much fruit there is and what the size of the canopy is. And um, in, in New York, uh, where Terry is, uh, you know, Concord's one of their big crops. And the growers there, so he, I think he's helping change their perception, but they would very aggressively manage their crop for yield. And so as a result, if you looked at their year-to-year -year yield, they would get like 16 tons per acre one year and then seven tons per acre the next year. And they were on this diurnal cycle where they would overload the crop one year and then there'd be a year of recovery. And so Terry's like, look, if you guys just manage your crop to be more balanced, um, you'll be able to, you know, hit 12 acre, 12 tons per acre every year instead of having these wild swings, and that's better for everybody. Um, of course, the science had been well known for a long time. What wasn't in place were ways of measuring, getting measurements during the season so that you could make these kinds of management decisions. Um, and so, you know, the, this, this plot kind of shows, you know, time, on this plot, you've got fruit yield, you know, how much fruit there is on this axis, how big the vine is on this axis, and this kind of balance the area where you want to stay in. So if we can measure the amount of fruit on the vine and the size of the vine, then we can figure out whether we're too high or too low, and they can either take leaves off the canopy or, which hardly ever happens, or take fruit off the vine, which is the, the much more common one. Um, so, you know, our solution to this, and this was Steve Nusby, who was a postdoc in the lab um, back then, we developed this camera. It's really nothing that fancy, but as you'll see, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of this. Um, it's a stereo pair, high resolution cameras um, with xenon flash lighting, all in a box with a computer and GPS and, and all the stuff. And we just drive it around and take pictures. So we can put it on, of course, I'm from the Robotics Institute, so we like to put it on robots. But, you know, nine times out of 10, it goes on an a ATV that's driven by a person, and that's fine too. And so we can drive through these kinds of environments, very large, just take pictures, drive up and all, down all day, and we can um, look at the pictures, and we can feed them into sort of the, the AI kinds of algorithms that everyone's familiar with these days. Um, it's a supervised learning algorithm to sort of count and size the grapes that you see in this case. So we can drive around, see the grapes, we got the GPS, we know where we are, um, and we can make sort of maps of, of what's going on in the field. We can provide this level of detail uh, how many berries there are. And this will work early in the season. Also, those were red grapes I was just showing, but we can detect them when they're very young, when they just set and they're small and green. So we get this notion of how, you know, what the density of the crop is out there. Um, we can also, you know, look at the vines and segment out the leaves and get this notion of what the size of the vine is. And then, um, you know, Terry can take that information and he uses it to make a map of what the crop load is currently everywhere in the vineyard and then turns that into how much should I how much how much fruit should I take off at any point in time and you know he and the folks at Cornell made this machine do I have a picture of it yeah um so they they basically took this is an over the row harvester that they've modified to make it a fruit thinner so instead of harvesting it's just knocking fruit off and there's a knob you can turn and it'll knock off all the fruit when you're in harvest mode and it'll knock off no fruit and you can get anywhere in between them. And they've, you know, set up hydraulics and done some engineering to make it so that um, you can drive through it. If you have this map, it's telling you where you want to take more fruit off in other places. You can feed that into their system. It's reading the GPS. The machine automatically knows where to take off more fruit and where to take off less fruit. Um, and so as a result, this, this um, operation that Terry's known for a long time we wanted to do becomes achievable, right? It's still expensive for the growers. And there's still an, a, an adoption curve because it's hard to get things adopted um, in, in these industries, but we're closer. And, you know, Terry now has a machine he can take out and show the people. How, how quickly can it uh, adjust? I, you know, I don't know, but it's like, I think the, compared to the rate they're driving at, it's pretty, pretty quick. Um, I don't know if, I mean, and this is a course. So he, he basically, here's, this is the map. You know, he divides the field into three zones. So it's not, this isn't like super fine spatial resolution he's operating on. And, um, okay. uh, one thing they've done, I need to get a picture of it. He took a, I love, I love the ag schools. Um, like they're so good at branding. So he took one of his research vineyards 
And he used this method to make a big C in the in the vineyard. So when you look at it with a satellite photo, you can see this big C um, because yeah, he managed it in such a way that the canopies would grow more. And anyway, uh, the, the branding is just fantastic. But this is an example. So we're taking, you know, is this robot? Is this robotics? I don't know. I don't even know where it is. This is taking some of those tools I'm talking about, using them to solve a problem, working toward um, automation. Again, my vision is that women harvesting grapes. I want to do that. Some of the things we're doing here, being able to understand the environment a little bit, is, is getting us toward there and also solving the problem. Um, I'll just say a little aside. Uh, and you know this. So this particular project led to you know it led to another project that was funded by RVE that then um, led to commercialization of this camera. So I'm a co-founder of a startup that's trying to commercialize this camera, trying to sell this service. Um, you know, crop load prediction and also several other physiological features of grape of, of grapevines um, to the to the wine industry. How's it going? I don't know. We're Three years into it and haven't gotten out of business yet, so I call that pretty good. Um, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough world for tech startups and especially for ad tech startups. Um, but we're out there using these cameras to provide useful, useful information. Um, the message I want to give today about this is that to the outside world, this seems pretty trivial, right? There's that red box that Steve Nusky made 12 years ago that worked well and I showed you guys the results, right? And there's the green box that Bloomfield is selling now. And you look at those and you're like, oh, there's no difference between those. What, it took you six months to get from this one to this one? No, in fact, it took several years and millions of dollars. Um, and, and it's important to understand why. And I think it's important for us all who work in this space to be explaining to the stakeholders the realities and why that is, right? The stakeholders wanna hear, I'm gonna solve your problems tomorrow with AI. And if you, if you say that, you're lying to them, whether you know it or not. If you don't say it, they fill in the gaps and they will accuse you of lying to them even if you didn't. So I think we all have to sort of actively, you know, you don't want to be too pessimistic, but we have to actively, you know, give little reality checks. So, you know, here, when I show those great results from CMU, you know, this is the part I never told people in those talks back in the day, which is that sure, we took this camp, okay? But the system on those vehicles was sort of a kludge. There was wires going all over the place. The GPS unit was separate. We had that a special generator that we stuck on the back of the ATV and a power conditioner and drive the camera. Um, we had graduate students and technicians who would run the system. No one else in the world knew how to run it. Um, you know, that's Zanya. She would collect the data with the laptop. She'd take it back to the lab. She had a big rack server sitting next to her, and she would spend a couple of months, you know, sorting the data out and cleaning out the bad data and, and developing the algorithms and, and, and then show the result, right? And so that's nowhere close to a commercial product, even though to the outside world, it looks really close, right? Um, and so, you know, what Bloomfield wanted to do is that same kind of thing, but get all that other crap out of the loop, and that takes a long time. Uh, and so, um, like I said, we're, I think we're getting close, but even that is still, still a ways down. Uh, this is what the camera looks like now. And of course, you know, marketing people and make nice pictures and you gotta get investment. Um, this is kind of what it, what it looks like in the field today. And this really is all those lies that were told in those academic talks 10 years ago are, are mostly gone. There's still a few of them in there, right, that we're working on getting out. Um, but it really is now as simple as an untrained person can, not untrained, someone who's, who's spent like an hour or so talking to someone from Bloomfield can stick this thing on a vehicle by themselves, um, collect the data, drive down the field, collect images, um, and then it gets uploaded to the cloud and there's a dashboard and they can look at it, right? And all this stuff, costs a ridiculous amount of money and takes a ridiculous amount of time. And in fact, it takes probably an order of magnitude more time to do that step than it does to do that initial proof of concept right there, right? So, um, you know, I used to believe in this stuff and sell it hard and and uh, and now I realize that that's, that's not the right approach because people stop believing you once, you once they realize you don't know what you're talking about. 
<laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Argue with that one. <laughs> back, back to the research. Okay, so um, you know, it, I so I just spend I spend like half a day a week with the Bloomfield group. I really love being a Carnegie Carnegie Mellon and doing that early proof of concept stuff. So so back to that, you know, I think we've we've learned a lot on this perception and how to build systems, and we're just starting to scratch the surface of how to do manipulation um, in agricultural environments. And I sort of think about this in two different ways. Like I said, I like to solve um, problems. I like to solve real problems, um, but I also want to get towards this, you know, general purpose automation. And there's sort of two ways of going about, uh, about, about doing research in the space. The one I call top down is sort of solve the general problems and then adapt those general solutions to the specifics you want to do. And then the one I call bottom up is just to solve specific easier problems and then hope that you get enough of those together and eventually that turns into a general solution, right? Um, the bottom up is, is much more sort of short term specific problem kind of thing. The top down, I don't really think I know how to do, um, although I'll, as, I'll, as I'll get to, we got some ideas that we think might get us there. Um, but we have had a couple of examples of success in this, in this top-down space. Um, so this is, uh, this is a robot we built called the Robotinus. Um, you see here, it's gonna, it's gonna pull together all those, all those sort of different areas I talk about, mobility, this is an autonomous robot that'll drive around and, and go through the rows. Um, it's got perception, so there's a camera on the back of it that looks very similar to that other red box. You know, it's been through several generations, but we, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of that thing. Um, and then this one has this very simple manipulator arm on it to do some simple interactions with the plants. Um, so corn stalk, the specific uh, thing we want to do was insert a penetrometer into a corn stalk to measure um, basically the, the reaction force because the grower, uh, the breeder we were working with believed that that would be a good analog for, um, for logic. Just a quick question. Uh, going back to your previous example of the, uh, the, the vineyard, mm -hmm. uh, how would you upload data to the cloud and what sort of operations are being conducted uh, there? Like, uh, do you have like a 5G connection or 4G connection on the device or you take it to the lab and then uh, like hook it up? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's one we talk about all the time. So. Um, there are so so right now there is a hard drive in the in the camera, and um, the our sort of best practice is the more advanced growers have a gigabit connection on site, and so we also have a little peripheral that we can plug into their internet that sits there. So they pull the hard drive out of the camera and stick it into the peripheral and up, uploads it to the cloud, um, and then even then so so we'll collect a couple of terabytes of data in a day of driving. So it still takes several hours to get that data up to the cloud. That's in, in the best case. Um, in the worst case, they'll mail the hard drive. And, yeah, exactly. And, so out of curiosity, what bandwidth do you need to keep up with the machine in terms of image collection? I don't know if that's a fair question, but if I'm going to if I'm going to transmit it immediately, what do I need? Yeah, I think you need about half a gigabit. Okay. Yeah. Um, and because uh, because it uploads at about like. Eight hours a day, it takes about four hours. Okay. Okay. But I'm a little confused by that, George, because you showed real time. You had this like uh, flashing real time in one of the videos. So how is that possible? For yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's actually a great point. So so there's um, there's a couple of things that are pushing us to put the um, detection on the edge. So that camera has a Jetson Xavier in it. Um, and that peripheral that we sell also has high-end computer with some GPUs in it. Um, now, from the commercial side, we're not really doing that yet. Like the, when, when we do something for a customer, it's coming up to the cloud because it still requires some human eyes on it to make sure it's working. Um, but as we get more and more confident, the plan is to push those things down to the edge. So we can do the detection on the camera itself. Um, and then of course we lose the data, which is another thing we'd like to have the raw data. Awesome. Uh, do you interest, uh, so for the 
camera on the edge to do the detection. You iteratively keep up, uh, updating the model on that uh, camera. Is there, is there a process for that, or we we don't have a process for that? Okay. Oh, I mean, and like that's like that's on the roadmap and it's going forward. What we've done so far is train models on data we've collected and run it on that edge. Okay. Um, so yeah, so so you know, and it's it's interesting that I mean, you the, your question touches on the big crux. I'm sure this isn't a surprise to, to any of you. The data transfer issue is really a challenging issue. Um, the company Bloomfield, our biggest expense is AWS cloud services right now. Wow. So um, they're not cheap. They're not cheap, and we're using it a lot. And so pushing this to the edge has benefits of eliminating that communication and also saving us money on the computation costs because we can run the models on computers that we own um, or that the grower runs if it's their camera. The, um, of course, the problem is, is we're still learning how to do this. So we still need to have the raw data to train the models and evaluate how they're doing. All that stuff. George, I, I, because he won't say it himself, you got to talk with Harry after this. He's okay. a machine learning expert in particular uh, in this context. Great, great. Often doing really efficient machine learning. So. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's very awesome. Okay, so so this one, this is the robotanist. It's doing sorting phenotyping. This is part of the RPE uh, Terra program. If any of you are familiar with it, it was like breeding for bioenergy. Um, and so this is an example of that bottom-up approach. Um, so this is my student, Mary, Mary Jenkins, who was a master's student. And he had to take this arm, reach out to a sorghum stalk, grab it. He, he invented this little gripper thing. I think there'll be a video of it. That like grabs the stalk from behind, pulls it into a little notch, and drives a penetrometer in so clever little mechanical design. And it took a bunch of, um, I won't call them simple, but straightforward techniques, things that we already knew how to do, like look at an image and detect where the stock was, take a sequence of stereo images and build a 3D model, project the stock detections onto the 3D model, fit cylinders to the, to the stock detections, right? Use some constraints about what we know about the world. The stocks grow vertically. So we're looking for vertical cylinders, not horizontal cylinders, right? A lot of very specific assumptions, right? This is what I mean by bottom up. We're solving this problem. We're not claiming to solve any other problem. Um, and so he pulled together this, this, this pipeline that does all these different things, you know, does the vision, sort of segments out parts of the stock, eventually um, detects the stock and identifies good grasping points on the stock, looks at a scene, picks the best one. And, and reaches out and, and grab it. And so, you know, what it kind of looks like all together in, in operation, the top left is, is the brain, right? So these are the pictures that are coming in as the robot's driving around. Merit's pipeline is doing this kind of relatively simple pipeline of computer vision techniques. In fact, at this time, we weren't even using deep learning yet to do the stock detection. He was, we since have started doing that, but this is all kind of old school computer vision methods, uh, clever mechanism, and then you put it all together and you can drive down a row and you can you can collect these missions, right? So again, we solved this problem. I think we learned a lot in the process of doing this, uh, but I wouldn't claim we solved any other problems, right? If anybody else wanted to grab corn stocks, which is something we're doing now in our AI center, then, you know, there's some techniques here that can transfer, but this is not a general purpose solution. Um, here's another one that's, that's sort of similar, bottom up kind of thing. Um, this is dormant teasing grapevine pruning. So our relationship with Terry Bates continues. Uh, we like the dormant season grapevine pruning as a robotics application for a couple of reasons. First of all, all the leaves are gone, so it's easier to perceive what's going on on the tree. Um, really importantly for robotics, you have a long time to do pruning. Um, it's not like harvesting where you got to get all the fruit off in a week or else the grower loses some money. We've got from November until April to, to do the pruning. Um, there's also lots of pretty good mechanized pruners out there. And, and so really kind of the standard best practice now is you go through a mechanized pruner and then you send a crew of people behind it and just kind of clean it up and, and get it perfect. So um, all, all these things kind of mix together for something that I think is a believable application. Uh, what is the accuracy of your uh, like models prediction now? Like, is it in the high 90s? Uh, like, for instance, you are driving by and predicting the size of the grapes, or for instance, like trying to differentiate between the trellis fire and the canes. Mm -hmm. What is the accuracy of your prediction? So, so you know, 
in the university at the proof of concept stage, we are training on the same distribution that we're doing the inference on, right? So our, our accuracy is very high. Okay. You know, we'll go out, we'll go up to Terry's Vineyards and we'll collect the data set and we'll label it and we'll train and we'll get it working really well on that particular vineyard, that particular vine architecture, that particular variety of vine. So it's um, kind of overfitted to that particular and use it, case. And it, you know, how long does it generalize when you go somewhere else? Some things generalize, some things don't. And, um, but, you know, we're not, on the CMU side, we're not in the business of now taking these models and going out and testing them in 10 different things. Okay. Um, so, but, so, so what we're doing in this case is looking at the grapevine, um, you know, the, this probably, most of you probably know this, but this part here is called the cordon. It's like the woody part of the vine that is there, it's perennial, it's there every year. Um, all the, most of this other stuff, right? These thin little wispy things shooting off are called canes and they are one year of growth. So, you know, the cordon's there always, um, the uh, the canes grow and all the fruit and all the, all the leaves go off the cranes and the canes at the end of the year, this is all pruned off and you're sort of pruned back to cordons with a prescribed number of buds left on the canes at the, at the end of the year. Um, so the real game in pruning is to leave a certain number of buds per meter or buds per vine, however the particular grower wants to think about it. So our goal is to look at these grapevines, find the buds, <laughs> and do a little bit of reasoning about the structure of the grapevine so you can figure out where to cut it to leave a certain number of buds on the vine. Um, and this is sort of the, let's see, let's start this video here. This is kind of an example of, of the perception side of this. So we can build, this is a young vine, obviously. We can build this kind of dense 3D point cloud model now. Um, and then the, the green dots on here are the detect, detected buds, which are detected just using supervised linear on images, and we project the, the images on, onto the lines. Um, and so uh, when we put this all together, again, in a simple vine case, uh, the, the manipulation part is pretty easy because the vine is not very complex. Once you know the X, Y, Z of where you want to make the cut, you just reach out. Um, and so here we've got camera scanning the vine, we can build this model, uh, we can do this in real time, um, and then we can do, again, these are very specific algorithms to the vine case where we're segmenting out the canes, we're counting buds outward from the cordon, and then now we can go to each, each cane, and so if you say leave two buds per cane, we can count two buds, that's the XYZ, we go snip it, and then you'll probably recognize almost everything in this picture is an off-the-shelf robot, except for the slider we put the arm on, right? So it's a clear path platform, their Warthog. It's fantastic. It's like the best mobile platform ever, UR5 arm, everybody's using that. And then we have this slider, so the UR5 goes down along this, this side. And we had to make a little custom um, cutting tool. Um, so this is another example of bottom-up approach. Um, and, you know, we're continuing to do a lot of bottom-up work because it's really like we don't know how to do top down, and we got it. We, we want to solve problems and, and write papers and do proofs of concept. Um, so, you know, systems of systems is a, is a pretty powerful approach. We now have this big toolbox of different techniques we can draw on. We have different components like that camera, um, like the robot arms and the robot platforms. And it's it's not easy. It still takes a lot of work and and, and a lot of money, but you can take these building blocks and put them together. And then you have something that you can use to address a, a specific problem. Um, so that's all. That's all the good side of it. Uh, you know, the bottom side, the the the, the, the downside is that um, it's not clear how this work generalizes. Uh, it's you know the kinds of manipulation tasks we're doing are all pretty simple. So those two examples I gave you, all the work is on the perception. Right, so we do a lot of work to perceive the environment, build the model, figure out what we want to do. And then once we have that grass point detected, we just go straight forward. There's no, there's none of this, like in the great hardest video where you saw her reach the thing and sort of turn around and look at the backside, right? Or if you watch people counting apples or picking apples, they'll push the branch out of the way with one hand and reach in and nothing like that. Um, and so there's no, there's no contact um, and it's not clear how these things generally. 
So even though it's a lot more ambitious and a lot less clear, I also want to push this top down uh, methodology. So here's an example of a more realistic grapevine. So those grapevines I showed you were just like a couple of years old. Uh, this is more what they look like. And so this is a tangled mess. Okay. We can still do a lot of the stuff. We kind of get the 3D model. You can see there's a lot more occlusion. The model's probably not as good. If we're doing the sort of simple segmentation things to trace those canes, we're going to run into problems where they cross each other or where our model is broken because part of it was occluded. Um, so some of the things work, some of the things don't. Um, you know, and again, this is this is my motivation, right? So we're not doing anything close to any of this kind of stuff. Yeah. George, real quickly, a question for you. You, you know, you've you've accepted the environment for what it is in terms of the, the great trellises and, and the current cultural practices. Right. I know Washington State was working on why don't we create different architectures to support automation? In right. other words, you, you know, you show a mess there in terms of the canes. I get that. And that's right. a very difficult environment, very noisy environment. But the other thing is, what about when you begin training those canes and there's a different architecture to the canes and so i'm just wondering where is that happy median and, and how do you you got to move things from both sides and I, I don't i don't know that you can do it from one side or the other I agree, I agree. You know? and actually there's even another factor which is the varieties that you use right there's a breeding there's a breeding question as well um i i agree with you 100 um our approach right now is to look at the most progressive best practices and assume that everybody's going there. Yeah. Um, because though, like in the Washington State case, yeah, they've done some things to sort of tweak their trellises for automation and tweak the way they train the trees on them for automation. But they were moving toward trellises long before that for lots of other reasons, like light interception. And, and um, so, and that was one of the first things that, like, I was surprised the first time I went into one of those orchards way back when. Was, oh, this is like, I can imagine doing this, right? It's like a wall with fruit on it. Um, and then they added things like, well, why, what if we prune the trees so that all of the flowers are pointing out outwards, right? Or what if we thin the flowers so that we thin the ones that aren't pointing out? It makes it even easier because then the robot doesn't have to have to reach around. Um, so I, I definitely uh, agree with the sentiment that this, the, the growing system, the automation solution, crop variety, they all need to evolve together. Part of the problem is they're all on very different time scales, you know. Um, in fact, if you if you factor in the AI part of it, the mechanical part of it, the growing system part of it, and the genetics part of it, they're all on very different time scales. The AI can move really quickly. Mechanical solutions take a little bit longer. You know, I have you know, if I have a student working on computer science problems, you know, they're cranking out a new iteration of their algorithm every couple of weeks, and we're testing it and if I have a student working on a mechanical thing like Merrick's little stock grabber, you know, one or two iterations per year is about as good as we can do there. Um, and then, you know, if I'm asking a grower to install a new trellis system for his vineyard, what is that? Every 10 or 15 years. And so, so I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to break it. I don't, I, I think it is like, it's almost like we need a discipline that's kind of agricultural systems thinking that thinks about that whole thing from end to end of the process solutions. So I'm aware the problem exists. I have nothing wise to say. In, in, the, in the case of uh, strawberries, though, you have Driscoll. And, you know, the vast majority of strawberries consumed in the U.S. come from one company. Right. So, and, and I get where you're coming from, because as you move around the country, especially with vineyards, um, there's all kinds of different styles all over the country. So, yeah. Yeah, it was so I can tell a little anecdote. I um when I first came to CMU, um there had been there was a project with the American Nursery and Landscape Association, actually with some growers up in uh northern Ohio, container nursery type operations. Maybe you maybe you're aware of this, and they had, you know, their co-op had given Carnegie Mellon a ton of money to build a robot for them. Um and it was a disaster. And uh the uh the you know there was a robot it cost too much money nobody was happy with it um i i was just kind of on the tail end of that so i knew like the the history and some of the relationships i didn't really get like embroiled in any of the arguments that came out of it but like five or six years later i was working at willoway up in you know again up sort of near cleveland and 
and uh, they actually had the robot in their in their barn. And I just kind of sheepishly said, "Hey, can I look at that robot? I've never seen, I've heard these stories about. It. I've never seen it before." And so they took me. Oh, yeah, sure. And they took me to it, and I looked at it, and they said, "You know, so uh, was it worth it? This experience of trying to build this robot?" And the guy said, "You know, for a long time, the answer to that would have been a hard no." But what it did was it made us realize that we need to standardize on container size. And that lesson alone turned out to be extremely valuable for that industry because instead of having 15 different container sizes, they quickly standardized down to three. And that made, you know, someday they'll get automation there. But that made a whole bunch of other things a lot easier and more efficient by realizing they had to go to that kind of standardization. So I think that, you know, the growers have to go through a little bit of pain to to be motivated to standardize and well but the other thing is and, and you know i don't know anything good that came out of the pandemic but one of the things that a lot of organizations have learned is labor is key to their success and right. access to it and when you don't have that access that changes what you do as an industry yeah. so yeah yeah I, I want to build on scott's initial point um and i'm wondering if it's you know, uh, one way in which you could think about um, transforming the environment would be to send your pruner across the field very frequently. Mm -hmm. Like, if you just never allowed it to get messy in the first place, right? right? So you're always sort of pruning this and sort of directing. And I'm wondering if the engineering is really there for that. Like, that would then be a pretty intensive task for the robotics. It looks like that are there, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you guys could do that at scale at that level of frequency. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it, your statement that the engineering is not there is 100% true. Okay. Um, and you'll see, so I'll just give you all a little window because you're all gonna see lots of videos like the ones I showed here with that. Universal Robotics UR5 arm on some commercial platform. That UR5 arm is not going to survive an agriculture, a real agricultural application. It will survive, you know, a sort of fairly rigorous proof of concept at the university level. But when you go out to the industry, that UR5 arm is not the solution. And there's not a there's not a current drop-in. Like you can't go to another company and pay twice as much money and get an arm with similar capabilities that's that's recognized. Um, if I was going to start a second startup, I, that might be where I where I where I do it because these technologies, um, there are so many people doing these proof of concepts with that UR5 that eventually a silver bullet one that is like a no brainer. This is going to add a ton of value is going to pop up, and then someone's got to develop that arm, and that's going to cost a lot of money to just to get it. So let me make that question quantitative. How long? How much of a field? can you guys do can or if not you can the state of the art do now with that arm like so i mean we, that you could we, 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 in, in four hours we can do one row so that's way way too slow now okay yeah uh and again this is so you know, i talk about the caveats and in fact we're on this road um this that that is what we've done to date has been for those young minds that are relatively okay. simple and um, so these kinds of things, I, I don't want anyone to be under any illusion that this is going to solve the pruning problem anytime soon. You know, where it's, this is at least a decade out from being, uh, you know, being in operation. Um, slightly out of the question, maybe. Um, are there any concerns or constraints regarding power or energy utilization uh, for this kind of a system? Um, I. It's a good question. Uh, I, I think that generally the agricultural vehicles are big enough that they can carry enough power around. Um, and things get a lot easier as you move to an electric platform. So if you believe there's going to be electric tractors anytime soon, then that'll make all of this integration easier and, and cheaper. Um, they, they do use a lot. I mean, there's, you need power. But if you compare it to the power you need to do the other types of agricultural automations that, that are already, you know, in standard practice, it's relatively small. Okay. okay so um, this is good. I'm, I'm, 
I'm just going to briefly, we're 45 minutes already. So, um, I just want to pitch uh, the center that we're working on because that's why I'm here. You know, Chris and I met through that. Um, so th this is uh, IRA. It's one of the four AI institutes that was funded through the USDA track. Um, so even though the review and everything goes through NSF, I don't know how familiar you guys are with these programs. The NSF managed the review, but then now the money comes from USDA. Our program managers are USDA program managers. Um, we're still kind of connected, but in a in a less formal way than the other AI centers. Are. Um, and so this is Iowa State is the lead institution. Iowa and CMU are like the two the two big ones, and then we have several partners that have one or two PIs each. Um, the big idea is plant modeling AI digital twins is is what we're what we're going after. Um, there's you know digital twins is one of these words that a lot of people are getting excited about. No one really knows what it means. So just defining digital twins is kind of our first task. Um, but it's not the naive idea you would just think when you hear the word digital twins. Right? We're looking for um, for plant mo for models of different aspects of the plant system. So this might be a field level model. It might be an individual plant level model. It might be just a model of sort of one physiological function within a plant. Um, and, and the idea is to tie together um, this long history of, of, um, of models that people have been working on for hundreds of years that are sort of analytical or data driven, but have, have very compact analytical form um, and use the, uh, the AI that we all know about as sort of glue to pull those together and to make them generalize and, and make them train better. Um, we have all the different features that I'm sure you all are familiar with. Um, application oriented, we have a big social science team that's looking at this problem of how do you uh, how do you work with stakeholders to make it more likely that your your developments actually solve problems and also will be acceptable and more easily adopted. Nobody really knows how to get agricultural technologies adopted and except for getting bought by John Deere. And that's the only that's the only path right now for like any of these high end technologies out there. So um, you know, we're trying to figure out some of those things. Who do you talk to? What, what are their, their concerns? Um, data privacy, data security, I think those kinds of things matter. Um, not that not to the low-level details, but people just want to have confidence that we're out there collecting all this data. There's not some big brother who's gonna scoop it all up and manipulate. Uh, markets and screw the screw the growers. So but, anyway, but, but then again, you just said the only way to commercialize things is through John Deere. I, to, it's today, a, it's, it's a bit of irony in there. Yeah, it is. It is right. And I think this is one of those things. You know, working in agriculture technology to me, I mean, I'm a relative newcomer. I've only been doing this for fifteen or twenty years. The the, the like we are in such a strong local minimum in, in terms of agricultural production. Everything is so efficient. And works so well and feeds so many people and cranks out so much food. And I'm over here saying, here's these other ways of doing it that are not even close to being as good yet, and probably never will be, even when they get good, as you know, cutting down all the trees for miles and 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 growing one crop with big combine. So I, you know, I don't know. We're doing things off on the corners, trying to figure out how to get them to trickle through. So anyway, this is Ira. Uh, like I said, it's why I'm here. Um, lots of different places, people. Da, 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 da. Um, what I, I'll, I'll just quickly wrap up and say, you know, the technical thrusts are kind of in the middle of this. So we're looking at kind of building these models, using these models for operation in the field. Like I said, there's sort of a social science part to get growers to adopt and democratize, teach people how to do this. And those are the, the main research components. Unsurprisingly, mine is in the build area. And I'm particularly interested in the kind of mechanical aspects of the plant modeling, because I want to get to that touching plants, pushing branches out of the way. That requires understanding mechanical properties. We've done a bunch of that. Happy to talk about it offline, but with that, I'm just going to skip through all these slides and say, you know, manipulation is hard. We're making progress. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things we need from the AI community to help us get there. What I would recommend is maybe we should ask anyone online that wants to ask questions yeah. to go first because you guys don't have the ability to interrupt. 
just go ahead and unmute. We're not actively monitoring hands. I'm wondering I, if social scientists were relegated to um, just the adoption of the technology piece or if they were involved in the original research questions. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so they, uh, there is, I guess the short answer is, I don't know. Um, there were social scientists on the team that wrote the proposal uh, and they uh, proposed this cyclic, I wonder if I've got the slide here, I might have cut it out. Yeah, so, so this sort of um, feedback loops in the development process, this comes from the social scientists. Um, and so I, I don't know, I, you know, being, I, I, don't, I don't think any of us on the technical side understand how to work with the social scientists yet. I think that this is something that, that we're learning how to do. Um, and, uh, you know, we're hoping that these things turn into uh, research questions that pop up uh, in later parts of the, of the project. That's why there's these, these feedback loops here. Um, as of now, we're a little over a year into it, and we're still kind of talking different languages. Um, you know, they're asking um, the technologists for products they can show to the growers to get feedback. And um, the technologists are providing products that are different from what they're asking for. And we're trying to, trying to make that connection. Uh, and we haven't succeeded at it yet, but we're working hard. Another question online? So uh, as you're flipping through the slides, I quickly uh, glanced or uh, glimpsed something about CI or cyber infrastructure, I'm thinking. Uh, can you just... Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, would that be... Uh, it rings, uh, just before this, maybe, I saw some, uh, yeah, there was cyber infrastructure. So what sort of CI components are you guys envisioning there to support AI? Well, so, um, you know, we're working with, with the cybers people in Arizona. Okay. Um, and I think we're probably trying to tackle this the same way everyone else is. Right now we're talking about standardization of data sets and containerizing models so that things can sort of run through these systems more efficiently. Um, I, I and yeah, we don't have a great answer to that. Okay. So I have a question um, about sort of building off of something Harry asked earlier. I'll say it and give you the opportunity to make the most profound statement that you're oh, boy. <laughs> decide the level to go. Uh, but when we look at integrating AI mm -hmm. into agriculture, is model accuracy a real problem? The context that I have for it, you know, you said, you know, the best solution that we know now is to cut down all the trees, do <laughs> things with more. We're not looking at things accurately, we're looking at things in mass, and we're just getting efficiency through that. Right. Uh, accuracy sort of has this individualistic component to it that feels very different and, and maybe a red herring here. Yeah, so I mean, this is so this is a really interesting question, right? Uh, so we don't. Currently, the, the current best practices, all the food we all eat is driven by managing crops at these very large scales. Um, AI technologies, robotics technologies, give us the potential to manage crops at plant level. Now, is that valuable enough to be worth it or not? I don't, I don't really know the answer. You know, I, I think that there are a lot of costs associated with um, the large-scale approach that we're not really paying right now that are being sort of pushed down the road. Um, there are a lot of costs that are immediate in the plant level approach. Part of the reason we work, part of the reason I work a lot in specialty crops is because they're closer. The value trade-offs there are closer to requiring plant level management. They're still not doing plant level management, um, but they're closer. That, that value proposition potentially could get there a lot sooner than, it, than it's going to get to quarters. 
But even within accurate models, I'm sorry, Scott, no, let's just okay. finish it. Even within accurate models, I can do plant level management. It just may be wrong, right? It's the cost of sending that arm to the wrong place, you know, three out of 10 times. Oh, okay. I think I, I think I, so I might have, I might have misinterpreted your, your, your question. So one, one of the places where models, the accuracy of the models really matters is at that bigger scale, right? Because there are people want to, one of the questions, and this is sort of outside of my expertise, but one of the questions our Institute is addressing is what varieties of corn should be planted in which fields? Um, and so in order to do that, you know, we live in this world where the climate is changing and you need to be able to predict where the climate's going and you need to be able to predict, you know, we know these different varieties have different traits that allow them to perform differently in different climates. And we want to understand all that and, and map that out to ultimately, you know, yield bushels per acre or dollars per acre or whatever the metric is. And, you know, the differences are small enough that current models kind of don't quite get you to that level of precision. Well, I was just going to recognize, you know, you're working in specialty crops and certainly the margins are much different, specialty crops. The problem that the downside is you don't have, you can't, it's harder to scale things yes. with specialty crops. And, and I'll remind a lot of people, you know, I mentioned Driscoll. Uh, the vast majority of strawberries you buy in the supermarket come from Driscoll. Uh, pineapples come from Dolan Del Monte. And right. so, but, you, you know, when you look at, you can talk about monopolies, oligopolies, or whatever else right. when it comes to these crops. But, you, you know, there, there's a few select companies when you get into some of these specialty crops. The other side of the coin, and, and you, you know, I'm going to agree with this, too. we got 200 million acres of corn, wheat, and soybeans in the Midwest. Right. You know, that's scale. Right. Um, I, I would I would argue that in, in some respects, when I look at AI, um, perhaps some of the greatest benefits initially going to come through um, reduction in terms of environmental contamination. And I point to the AI products that are coming to market that will significantly reduce our use of herbicides. Right. So like very more rate spraying. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's going to translate into a cost benefit to the farmers. Yeah. But like I said, so some things may be driven more by environmental consequences than anything else. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing, and again, this is, you know, this is outside of what I really understand, but um, those precise models, plant level models are useful in the breeding pipelines as well, yep. as you sort of look out to try to fix some of those problems with the genetics. What, what, one of the things that my limited experience, and I'll be it, um, in, in agriculture with biological variation, um, what, one of my concerns has been when you're training some of these classifiers with limited number of it, uh, images, you're overfitting the models, right. okay? And then when you go out and you try to apply it in that generalized situation, it fails miserably. Right. And so what my, my assertion has been is we probably have to expand the training data sets substantially to, to pick up some of that variation that occurs. And we think about sun angles during the day. You know, we think about cloudy versus sunshiny right. days. We think about uh, soil textures in the background. You know, there are all those things going on in those environments that are going to affect the accuracy of those classification models. I agree so, 100%. Um, so I'll make, I'll make just two, I mean, I have nothing to say to disagree with that, but I'll make two sort of follow-on comments. Um, first is a little bit of a brag that camera you use with the flash lighting um, eliminates a lot of those yeah. environmental variation capabilities. And um, actually the best paper that Chris mentioned was sort of showing that that's true. Oh, so that helps, uh, but I think there's also a, some work to be done on the AI side, on the methods side, because a lot of the models now don't even know when they're overfitting, when they're 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 getting a data stream that's outside the distribution they were trained for, and um, so even detecting that and then how to adapt to it, um, you know, we're starting to get to think. I mean, you can envision a future where the models are self training and adapting. Um, and and improve the ways that we need we need to improve this. Right. Oh, so oh, one, I just saw the words RL fly by. Yeah. At some point. <laughs> Do, can you say a little bit about what you're thinking? So so yeah. So that's my that's this is my stab at a top down method. So um you know we'll let me, let me just put this slide up. I think this is sort of so we've spent a lot of time taking these models that we build of trees and um, adding dynamics to them and sticking them in simulation environments. 
And then the idea is to use that to scale up to these big simulation environments and start to train RNL manipulation algorithms that do the kinds of things like I need to reach this apple, but in order to do it, I need to push this branch out of the way and just kind of learn those things. Now, we haven't succeeded yet, oh, but I, I think that I think that that's got that's the kind of approach that we've got this pipeline where you can scan a plant, make a model of it, stick it in the simulator, predict how it's going to interact with the robot. Um, you know, and then there's RL methods to use that to come up with policies. Uh, it seems like it could be a general approach. Hasn't we haven't gotten to work yet, but that's kind of the selection I think. All right, shall we thank our speaker? We have built in a 30 minute break. Folks can go up and chat with George. All right. He's going to hang around. Jim will have some time after as well. Oh, I'll just I... really do want to say where you can do okay. Whatever you need. <laughs> thank you, George, for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, you can just. Are you walking out now, Scott? Yeah, unfortunately, I got an administrative meeting. Yeah, so. we'll walk through it.